Hello, welcome to episode 4 of Making 007. Uh, today we're going to use the moulds from episode 2 to create the dropouts. These are solid carbon parts, so using those moulds we're just going to pile in a lot of resin and fibre and just squish it down. So follow along to see how exactly that works. So here's the two halves of the mould. They're looking pretty good. There's a couple of imperfections and the process can still be refined but they're certainly some of the best ones I've done so far. Pretty happy with them. All the little uh, lines on the side there are to allow resin and air to escape while it's all squishing down. I've waxed and released them all and I've done my maths so it ends up quite nicely to need about 50 grams of reinforcement which I'm going to split between 25 grams of chopped carbon and 25 grams of unidirectional with a little tiny bit of woven mixed in. Um, show here a couple of choppies and then in the back you can see all of the unidirectional and a couple of little bits of woven. So I'm going to measure and mix the resin. There's more than enough here um, but you'll see as I'm going that it's this stuff's really quite hard to fully saturate so you're just going to end up using a lot of resin. So I mix up far more than I need and just expect it to all squish out but I'd rather there be more than less for these parts. Um, so I'll start by just laying down a nice even coat of resin over all of the kind of final surfaces of the part. Getting into all the nooks and crannies and trying to make sure there's no little bubbles or bits collecting already because we want to start off on the right foot obviously. and then. I've got some little scraps of woven here, which I'm just going to put in the area where the derailleur hanger sits, and on the other side I'll put it on the in this sort of little pocket where it sits as well. This was more of just a an attempt to see how well woven plays along in a compression mould. I didn't know if it would get all moved around or be a potential spot where bubbles could get trapped and be annoying but it actually came out really really well moved all around nicely so I'll probably continue that in the future on other parts um, just got to focus to saturate it all and squish it all in nicely then I'll get a small handful of choppies start poking them in dry because they'll stick to the layer of resin that I've laid down and then I will saturate them with the brush, which does get a little messy. And you've got to make sure that you're not just dragging it all back out with your brush. But from experience, this is kind of the best way to do it. You can try putting a load of dry choppies into the into a cup of resin and giving it a mix, and then just sort of putting all of that in like a big charge molding kind of procedure. But the problem is when you do that and when you mix it you just end up with such an enormous amount of air mixed into it that you're just fighting a losing battle trying to squish that all out so this is the best and only way to do this particular process um, and what I'm doing here is putting in unidirectional all the way along so this is going from sort of tip to tip of this dropout wrapping around the area where the Really a hanger all sit. Um, it, 90% of the uni is just going on those sort of directions and then the choppies will give a kind of all over strength. I could talk about the strength of this like it's carefully planned but realistically this is a 12 to 13, 14 mil thick bit of carbon. It's completely overkill for what's needed and there will be more than enough strength there. In my previous dropouts I, 
I made them for Paragon Rocker Dropouts, so I had these kind of plates for them. Um, and with those they were 8mm thick and I was trying to cut patterns for them. And I'd just spend a whole day cutting like 40 odd layers in a sort of rotating quasi-isotropic kind of lay up and it's, it just gives you blisters on your fingers and gets absolutely nuts. So this works out quite nicely. It's a much more, it's a much easier sort of process. But um, when you see bicycle manufacturers touting their latest and greatest frames and talking about how they've got hollow dropouts and things, and I've seen some engineers being quite proud of having made the hollow dropouts, I think I saw an article about a, a Scott when they'd made the hollow dropouts on it in 2008 or whatever, and after trying to design all of it you can see why they are proud of it, because it's an absolutely mental task to make these hollow and make it a repeatable and uh, strong and reliable kind of process to do. Um, I've got some ideas for the future but it's still a pretty monster task to do that. But uh, yeah, this, this does for the moment. These, this pair of dropouts, drive side and non-drive side, ended up weighing about 190, 200 grams. So there are some serious improvements that I would like to make. But this is the first time designing dropouts for UDH and dro dropouts with flat mount on them, which is where the previous builds with the Paragon things came in quite nicely because I just had to design a couple of holes and then they had all the threads and the spacing and the accuracy all sort of done for me, but I've had to design now every little standard and spec to meet correctly, which is wonderful having the freedom of the design, but um, there's a lot more things to slip up on which these videos have already helped with actually because in the first video when I was showing some of the drawings I'd done for things the um, someone spotted a mistake I'd made with the flat mount 160 standard because I'd originally designed the non-drive side for flat mount 140 then decided to change to flat mount 160 and Peter Verdun who's done a lot of writing about all of this stuff, um, got in touch and said, hey, you've done that wrong. And then shortly after that, people on the custom frame building forum also said the same. So I ended up having to redo the non-drive side dropout. Um, but it's a good, a good thing about sharing your work, really. You can uh, have input from other people and they can tell you what's going on. So in the background while I've been waffling, I've been on five times speed getting the compression done on all of this lot. I've got some improvements here as well, I've, I've got a, a big plate of steel coming in which I'm going to use to uh, make a bit of a better compression jig for all of this lot, but for, for the moment in this video a couple of G clamps and a bit of patience. And you could see, see all of this resin coming out which I'm regularly wiping up. And you can see all the bubbles moving along and this this whole process took about you know half an hour 45 minutes of progressively squishing this closer and closer and closer to done and with the design of this mold the top wants to be pretty much flush and that's when i know i've got it all the way so i've still got a fair way to go um but yeah as it as it squishes down that's all of the this is this is equivalent to the tape in the previous video and equivalent to a vacuum bag and other things or equivalent to a bladder whatever method you get compression as long as it gets squished it's cool so this is where a bit of the magic of the design of these comes in so this is the non-drive side one i've only got a video of demolding this one but there's a couple of big m8 nuts embedded in the underside of the mold which were masked off. You could see it was some tape at the start of this video. Um, and what happens is when it's all cured, I can insert those nuts into the back, twist them like this. And I've got two on this one because it's quite big, so I can 
evenly apply pressure and it doesn't cant it over and lock itself in. But as I apply more and more turns to these threads, it starts pushing it out as you can see. And there we go, that one's pretty much out because it's a big taper at the top here. Once you've got it to move you know, five or ten mil, most of the work's done. I'm just sort of loosely turning those threads now to drive them through. You should be able to just pull it out by hand in a second. And this non-drive side one here wasn't the best piece. I made a couple of changes to the mould halfway through and as I say I messed up a small bit of the design so I did end up redoing it. But there's the finished pieces, you can see that extra bit I had to add on to the uh, non-drive side just to raise the uh, flat mount uh, mounting surface by 5mm or so. But you can see how it all sort of sits nice and flush, the UDH sitting in there nicely, a nice little hooded pocket for the uh, end cap for the wheel to sit in. I'm really really happy with them. So. I hope you've enjoyed watching this episode and hearing me waffle about compression moulding and various other things. Tune in for the next one. Thanks. <laughs>